a bit tired after two hours. So I'm not sure the, the people at the back will totally follow me, but we'll see. Um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm Sébastien Barraud. I'm a soil ecologist and ecosystem ecologist. Um, I'm working from, for IRD, French Institute for the Research for the, for the, development, for, for the development, so that I'm uh, doing my field work basically yeah, in Africa and I, in Ivory Coast. Um, and um, during my career, I have first worked on, I mean, on, on ecology, uh, the ecology of savannas, for example. And uh, more and more, I've been uh, thinking about uh, agriculture, uh, the, the lack of sustainability of agriculture. Uh, and that's the reason why today my, my class is about agroecology. So agroecology is application. I mean, one definition is a, agroecology is application of ecology uh, to agriculture. And um, probably my, my, my lecture will be in two parts. Uh, first, I will try to show you but probably you're already convinced that um, modern intensive agriculture is not sustainable. And in the second part, I will try to, um, uh, to propose some, some solutions. I mean, at least um, uh, little bits of solutions. Um, so first of all, why um, intensive modern agriculture is not sustainable? And what does that mean? Yes? It's, uh, it kind of decreases biodiversity as well. Okay, good stuff. Uh, I think the seeds are really not sustainable. And like it's not, it doesn't have the same variety of species, so it's not very resilient to climate change. Okay, yes, there is an issue about the diversity of the plants we are, we are cultivating. Yeah. Uh, other ideas? Yeah. <coughs> The cycle of nutrients uh, spectrum because it's actually uh, fed, so the, the soil is empty, void of any uh, nutrients. Okay, yeah, we have a problem of uh, with fertilizers. Uh, other other suggestions? I guess like monocrops are like really not good for land use, so it takes up a lot of space to produce. A very singular type of produce. So yeah, uh, uh, maybe the, the problem is not in safe that it's producing just one one type of food, but the problem is that, and I will try to show you later, is that um, probably diversity, biodiversity, is shown as a um, as a factor that is increasing resilience, for example. Uh, so the lack of biodiversity, of cultivated biodiversity, probably leads to a lack of resilience of cultivate of uh, agricultural systems. Yes. I think also on land use, like the it's if we were to take the economic sort of framework and use the language, like it's not as productive. So then you need a lot more space to produce. Like there's numbers of it. Like the, if you have agroecology, you can actually produce a lot more stuff. So you need oh. less land. Okay, uh, that's interesting because very often people say, are saying the reverse. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if I, if I, uh, um, I don't know, uh, if, if I go to, um, to, to, to talk about agroecology to put, put people working on um, economy, many people will tell, will ask me, yeah, but with agroecology, you're not going to produce as much as uh, with uh, intensive agriculture. And that's an issue. Um, um, Let's say that it's difficult to tell with what type of agriculture is producing the, the most. Uh, but then the problem is at least to have something sustainable. And that, uh, very often that's my first answer. Uh, you can think whatever you, 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 you want about um, uh, organic agriculture, about uh, agroecology, whatever. But at least what I know is that intensive agriculture is not sustainable. So it's no use trying to go on in that direction. Ooh. Yes. Which is a short question. You said there's a debate if it's like more, if there's more or less. And I wanted to ask like more per labor worked or more per square meter. Because I would say maybe yeah, okay. it's like more, it's less efficient. You need more labor power. But like if you are more diversity, you can on one square meter, you can maybe build more. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. It's, it's important. I mean, 
uh, even I'm, I'm starting to talk about intensive agriculture, but then even when talking about intensive agriculture, normally I should define intensive uh, relative to what in terms of energy, in, ter in terms of uh, human work. And uh, yeah, I think I was talking about the production in terms of production per hectare, for example. Uh, and um, um, basically the idea is that with agroecology, it should be possible to produce quite a lot. But then there are debates whether uh, about how much re how much you produce and whether you can really compare the production to to intensive agriculture. Of course, I think that uh, demand of intensive agriculture requires uh, like new capital startup. So poor countries and poor farmers don't have enough uh, funds to fund their own. So okay, uh, I mean, that's another good point. Uh, probably during my lecture, I will mostly talk about um, agriculture, intensive agriculture, as, as it is uh, done, uh, for example, in France. Uh, but of course, you have at the global scale, you have a diversity of agricultures. And um, uh, you, you have other types of agriculture, let's say traditional agriculture, agricultures that are probably more sustainable. Then there is also the question, um, for example, in, Afri in Africa, where I'm working, uh, probably the traditional practices are more sustainable, but then they do, do not produce as much, at least in, in these cases, uh, I'm sure they do not produce as much uh, per hectare Uh, a field of wheat uh, in, in France. And then you have the problem of the uh, they, they produce enough to feed themselves, condition of living. Uh, and then it might um, not destroy their soil, but at least lose fertility because they do not uh, have fertilizers and, and they don't have any, uh, uh, they don't, uh, do not have enough money to use machines and, and, uh, and the way we manage fertilization here in, in, uh, in Europe or in France. Yes? So this, is, this is just for plants or are we also talking about livestock? Uh, I'm, I will mostly talk about plants because it's what I'm, I, I know about, but uh, we, 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 we can discuss about uh, cattle uh, at the end of, of the lecture. Okay, so I, I can start to, to, to show uh, some slides about um, the reasons why uh, modern intensive agriculture is not uh, sustainable. Uh, does it work? No. Hmm. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Another idea on this slide is that okay, we 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 need to produce in a sustainable way, but we also need a multifunctional agriculture. Uh, what I mean by that is that more and more we can recognize that on the countryside. We need farming systems that produce food. Of course, we need to feed many humans, but we also need farming systems that uh, do not destroy biodiversity, uh, that provide other ecosystem services, that pro provide uh, clean water, that, that, that can store some carbon and not release carbon. Um, so it's also another way to think about agriculture. Uh, of course, food is important, but we also have to think about other types of ecosystem services. Um, okay, the good point is that uh, the, the world production of food has, uh, has increased. Uh, we, we don't really need to, to look at the numbers, but uh, the production has, has really increased. Um, one problem is that probably during the last years, um, here we have the production of cereals. Uh, the production has, is kind of uh, reaching a plateau. Uh, and there are also debates about why we are reaching a plateau. Uh, one, um, one argument is that with the climate warming, uh, we are losing already some production in many countries. Uh, one of the types of argument, argument is that probably um, it's difficult to increase more the production using the same types of uh, method, which is increasing pesticide, increasing uh, some industrial fertilizers um, and so on. Um, one problem with, uh, with agriculture is that uh, here you have numbers about the, the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases. 
And uh, in France, uh, agriculture is um, producing about 20% of uh, uh, our greenhouse gases emissions. Um, when you look at this, this type of number, you really have to um, um, think about what you have behind the, the numbers. And in this case, I'm not fully sure. Uh, but globally, at the, at the global scale, uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases by agriculture are between 20% and, and 30%. So, of course, we know that we have to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases. So, uh, agriculture is also a target um, for these reductions. Um, um, yeah, I can say a few words about uh, why agriculture is uh, produced releasing uh, greenhouse gases. Um, of course, uh, agriculture is using a lot of machines. So we are, the, the machines are based on, uh, on the on fossil fuels. Um, one problem with agriculture is the transformation of ecosystems. Uh, we still, I mean, cut forests to uh, grow food. Uh, this is the case in, uh, in Brazil, for example. Um, but this is important because that's, as soon as you're cutting a forest, you're losing the carbon in the forest and you're also losing the carbon that was stored in the soil. And um, another factor is, a, is that agricultural soil on, on the intensive agriculture, they tend to lose carbon. Um, you might know that um, uh, in fact, in, in soil, in soils, you have soil organic, what we call soil organic matter. This is the remaining of the dead leaves, the dead roots that are slowly decompose, let's say. And uh, in fact, in the soils, you have, as organic matter, you have more carbon than in the, the trees, forests, roots, whatever, and in the atmosphere. So you have a huge stock of carbon within the soil. And so each time you're releasing a little bit of carbon from the soils, you're increasing the global warming. And each time you're putting a little bit more carbon within the soils, you're kind of uh, mitigating global warming. Um, of course, we know now that uh, water is a problem. More and more crops uh, depend on uh, irrigation, both because of uh, climate change. And for example, we know that in France, the last summer has been very difficult and uh, we have a lot of issues about irrigation uh, because we have to choose what we want to do with the, with the water. And um, yeah, of course, it depends on the choice of the type of crop, the choices on the cropping system, because uh, there are many types of agriculture that would not need so much water. Um, okay. Um, yeah, these numbers are, are interesting. Basically, we people have tried to to measure how much of the primary production humans are uh, exploiting. So primary production is a production of biomass by ecosystems. And um, depending on the continent, humans are exploiting from 10% in Africa to 80% uh, in South Central Asia of the produced biomass. Um, up to a certain point, this is normal. We have many, many humans and our, the human population is still growing. So up to a certain point, it's fully normal that we exploit, exploit biomass. All, uh, all animals uh, in the biosphere need biomass to grow, to feed themselves. Um, but anyway, that's, um, that's a measure, that's an index of our impact on the biosphere, our, our impact on ecosystems. And um, my message would be, okay, it's normal that we have an impact on the biosphere, but we need to reduce this impact. And we, uh, we need um, this impact, our practices to be sustainable. Otherwise, uh, human societies are just going to crash. Yes? What is net primary production? Yeah, um, um, yeah, it's complicated. Um, yeah, you have growth primary production and you have net primary production. And uh, okay, primary production is the total amount of biomass produced by ecosystems. So basically, you you want to um, you you're you're growing a forest. At some point, you cut all the you have to cut all the trees. You dig all the roots. You dry them, and and you and you weigh 
what you have. And that would be the production of the forest during many years. So it's not production as what is produced by humans. It's oh, no, no, no. It's primary production. It's a, it's a primary producers, basically, uh, in the biospheres are our plants and uh, algae. They are the organisms that are producing biomass through photosynthesis. so high in NP, like 12 and 16 compared to two oh, or three? Um, I would not fully know, but basically uh, that depends on the human density. And then that depends on, on the, the development of, uh, of agriculture. Um, but yeah I'm, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit surprised by this number, actually. OK. Uh, Compared to like Western Europe, which is less than one, yeah, my my I, I, my guess would be that uh, this would be due, due to uh, yeah, we, this would be due to tropical forests. Okay, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah I haven't really thought about that. Actually. Okay. Thank you. I guess uh, forests and agricultural production on one hand, and also I guess that in Asia the the forests are also much more made as more people, so more of the forest has already been deforested. Yeah. 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 yeah um, so, so far, we, are, we haven't talked about meat, but of course, um, yeah, we will have to speak at some point about meat. Uh, to, to think about sustainability of agriculture. Yeah. But if you if you cut a forest to create cattle, yeah. that would enter there, right? Because yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I like the, the these are um, this is a global cereal production since uh, the 60s. So you see again that the production has increased a lot. Uh, which is great. Uh, this means also that humans are, are better fed. Um, but then you, what you see here is that you have the increase in, in uh, nitrogen uh, fertilization. Here you have irrigation, and here you have phosphorus um, fertilization. So you see that we have been able to increase a lot uh, the production. Uh, but I would say mostly it is due to the increase in the use of uh, nitrogen phosphorus and uh, irrigation. <coughs> what, would be, um, what would be the other factors leading to the increase in production since the 60s? Yes? Yeah, okay. Genetics of, uh, on seeds. Yeah, um, for sure we have, um, we have changed what we are cultivating and we have, let's say, improved the variety we are we're cultivating um, so it's it's called a crop breeding that's a breeding of new crops and um, um, okay um, my my understanding is that uh, there is a kind of synergy that we have had a kind of synergy between the fact that we are uh, breeding new crops we have selected new crops new var varieties and in fact, we have selected these new crops to be able to grow very well, to reach a high production when you increase fertilization, irrigation, and pesticides. So um, my understanding, but probably some other people would say something a bit different. My understanding is that, of course, the, the, the new varieties are, are, are interesting and they can grow quicker. They can, um, they, are, they can be up to a certain point more efficient. But they tend to reach this efficiency only when you give them when you give them a lot of fertilizers, a lot of pesticides, uh, a lot of water. Yes. Oh, it's uh, it's um, it's an absolute number at a global scale. Yeah, yeah. The, the, Probably behind these numbers, you also have the increase in the surface, the cultivated uh, surface. Sorry. Uh, no, you're right. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it's a global production, and here it's it's per hectare. Yeah, you're right. But then you you'll see that there is a uh, you see the connection between the two the two graphs. Uh, what is interesting here is that you you have the uh, the the production basically divided by uh, the quantity of fertilizers of nitrogen fertilizers uh, used, um, and you see that in fact this is a measure of the efficiency of the fertilizer, and you see that uh, this efficiency has this uh, this efficient efficiency sorry has decreased. Um, so what does that mean? Yes. Need more input, uh, inputs to produce. Okay. Uh, maybe. Like the like crop yield um, relative to the amount of fertilizer and other things that we use is actually decreased over time. Okay, again. Like the crop yield relative to the amount of fertilizer and stuff that we need to use to enable that crop yield. Is yeah. For for me, it means that uh, we can still increase a little bit the production, increasing the amount of, of fertilization. But then the increase is less and less important. So it means that we have reached the kind of maximum production uh, using this, this method, increasing the amount of fertilizer uh, we're using. Um, what, what are the problems re related to fertilization? I mean, up to a certain point, uh, the, the first idea is that um, using uh, artificial fertilization is very logical uh, because each time you're growing food, you're exporting the food. Of course, if you're growing food, it's because you export you have you want to export the food and to eat them somewhere else. So when you're exporting the food, you're exporting uh, the carbon inside the food, but you're also exporting the nitrogen, the phosphorus, uh, the potassium, whatever you have in the biomass. Um, so maybe it's something you're not familiar with, but the biomass, it's made of carbon, it's organic matter, but this organic matter is made of carbon, but also nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on. For example, I am made of carbon, but I'm also made of proteins, and for the proteins, I need nitrogen, and I, I also need phosphorus, and, and so on. So each time you're exporting food from a field, you're exporting also the nitrogen and the phosphorus. So somehow, if you want to go on cultivating the food on the field, uh, you need to replace the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and so on. So up to a certain point, fertilization is kind of very logical. Um, but then what is the problem? Yes? Um, like the runoff of, um, like from pesticides into water systems leads to like eutrophication and problems with the water system. Okay, um, that's pretty true. Uh, one problem is that a, a large part of the fertilizers in fact, we're putting so much fertilizer that a large part of it is um, driven away by rains, uh, by, uh, okay, you also for nitrogen, you have a, a reaction called denitrification, which is releasing uh, N2O in the atmosphere. Um, and for example, in uh, intensive cereal culture, it's up to 40% uh, of the fertilizers that are disappearing like that. You had something? The, the crops, the plants are basically less receptive to uh, nitrogen, so you have to put more. So it's also maybe, I don't know, but maybe that's... I, 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 I don't think they are really less sensitive, but yeah, somehow this is the case. I mean, what this curve means is that we're putting so much that uh, this no longer increases a lot the production. So this means that up to a certain point, the plants are no longer able to absorb more. So yeah, maybe that's the same idea. I have another idea. Maybe we just use lands that are not uh, like really receptive to growing because we need more, like for example, we forest uh, the Amazon, but the Amazon is not made for growing uh, soja, but then we still want to, and then it doesn't work so much. Uh, yeah, this I don't know. Uh, my um, okay. Um, my understanding is that, for example, Brazil. I mean, ag um, agriculture is a big problem in Brazil uh, because Brazil is developing a lot uh, cultivation in yeah, and to basically for economic reasons. And um, uh, basically, 
Brazil would say, or at least many people involved in this business in Brazil would say that their uh, practices are, are sustainable. Uh, but of course, my understanding is that when you're doing intensive agriculture, whatever the country, it's not sustainable. It's, it's just that uh, uh, it's pretty new in Brazil, or at least in some places in Brazil, so they don't figure out the problems. But we know now, for example, in France, that after 50 years of more intensive agriculture, uh, it's really a problem. Uh, there was, yeah. Uh, what about the increasing costs of fertilizer on farmers and thus giving cost of food? So, uh, of course, the cost, I mean, the, I will not talk a lot about that, but of course, the, this use of fertilization, this use of pesticide, of pesticide uh, it's pretty much related to the economic systems, and uh, you can have problems with the cost, of course. Yes? There's some communities that get sick, <laughs> like with cancer and such. But with, with fertilizers? Yeah. Yeah, probably more with pesticides than with fertilizers. Um, yeah. Don't know exactly already, but we have to get the fertilizer somewhere, right? Yeah. And you have to extract them, and it's like... Okay, so where, where are the fertilizers coming from? So, sorry okay yeah so so where, where how is it produced yeah 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 okay oh yeah okay uh, so the, the yeah yeah the the nitrogen is coming from the from from the from the atmosphere basically you you we're using the n2 for, from the atmosphere but to get this N2, to fix this N2, to transform it into uh, ammonium, uh, basically we need a lot of energy. And the problem is that we basically we're using, we're using gas to, uh, as a source of energy. And that's the reason why there's a, actually a shortage uh, of, uh, of fertilizer, or at least we, there is a threat of shortage of fertilizers, although their costs are increasing. Uh, basically, just because of the Ukraine war and the problem of uh, of gas and, and and so on, and this also means that uh, in any in any case, uh, using nitrogen fertilizers means that we are using uh, that we are emitting uh, greenhouse gases, and of course we know that we have to reduce uh, greenhouse gases uh, to to mitigate global warming. And phosphorus, it's another story. Phosphorus is coming from mine and from mines. And of course, uh, all mines at some point uh, uh, disappear. Uh, so there will be a shortage of phosphorus fertilizers. We don't really know when. It's like uh, oil. It might be in 50 years, it might be in, uh, in 100 years. Uh, it's not very clear. Probably there are stocks that we don't know yet, and they might be more difficult to exploit. Uh, but at least we know that it's not sustainable uh, because at some point we will, we will no longer have phosphorus in mind. Yes? So it's an interesting case of uh, Western Sahara because they have one of the world's largest reserves of phosphate. And the reason why the conflict in Western Sahara is so long lasting is exactly because of these reserves, because everybody wants a piece of them. Morocco and Algeria want them, Spain also wants them. And in the end, like you get a huge problem just because of a reserve of something that's used for a fertilizer in the Western world. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Yeah, I can... question. yeah, sorry. So those two graphs that we right, they're saying that although uh, the efficiency of uh, fertilizer decreased, you still sustain the same growth rate of uh, global cereal production for... Hydrogen. Yeah, it, what it means is that it has the, the, the increase in the use of nitrogen fertilizers. It has allowed to increase the production, but then it is less and less efficient, which means that we can add a little bit more nitrogen, but we, this will increase a little bit the production, but a little bit less than in the past. Yeah, but the tenants of production continues uh, growing at the same rate. So does that mean other technologies came in there? Yeah, but actually, it's, um, I mean, it's difficult to say, but it's, uh, if you look at here, you, you see that it's uh, kind of bending a little bit, and probably the, 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 it's no longer really increasing. Could it be like a, 
also biotechnology at sea? Yeah, I, nowadays I would not think so. Uh, one, um, but then, yeah, one problem behind the, these numbers, I think they are really interesting. But as I was saying earlier, you have at the global scale, you have many types of agriculture. So behind the numbers, you have different types of agriculture. And for example, um, at least uh, on the average in France, it's no longer possible to increase production, increasing nitrogen fertilization. But of course, you have countries in the world where it's possible. So, uh, yeah. Um, one of the problems with um, uh, intensive agriculture it, uh, is that it tends to degrade uh, soils. Um, um, so you have many types of degradation, but one uh, source of degradation is the er erosion by water and uh, wind. Uh, the problem with agriculture is that um, if you see a natural ecosystem, in a natural ecosystem, when it, at least when it's not a desert, you always have plants growing and the, the soil is, over, is always covered by plants. Uh, Whereas mostly uh, in um, agriculture, we're cultivating what we call annual plants, which means that we have to seed, to put the seed against each year. Very often we have uh, tillage in between. So in many, uh, many months during the year, your soil is no longer protected by plants. So it's increasing uh, erosion. Um, you have physical degradation, basically, um, one idea I'd say is that um, the soil must not be too much compacted. Uh, for a soil to be healthy, uh, you must have uh, aggregates of soils. And in between the aggregates, you have um, free space uh, for the water to infiltrate, for the roots to grow, for the uh, smaller organisms in the soil to, to live and, and move. So sometimes when you're using when you're using big machines like that uh, at the wrong moments in the year, you can uh, just um, um, de uh, destroy the structure of the soil and compact the soil, uh, which is which is bad. Um, what what what's not here is that uh, um, at a global scale, agricultural soil tends to lose organic matter. Uh, just before I was saying that uh, soils can store a lot of organic matter, so a lot of carbon. And what I did not say is that this uh, organic matter is very important for soil fertility. Um, it's very important because it's kind of um, uh, consolidating soil structure. And it's also um, facilitating the fixation of mineral nutrients within the soil. And also it's increasing the soil capacity to store water. So when you have a healthy soil, it's very, uh, uh, it's full of organic matter. So usually it's also very uh, more dark. Uh, when you dig uh, the soil, uh, the dark part of the soil, it's due to organic matter. And usually when it's dark, it's because the soil is fertile. And the, the, the loss of organic matter from ag agricultural soil is a, is a problem. Um, Yes. The, the fertilizer we put in it, uh, they don't break connection with degradation. No, um, uh, fertilizer, okay, Fertili fertilization is more a problem because we are losing fertilizers. And then the, the nitrogen or the phosphorus will go into the river or, um, uh, yeah, into the river. It can lead to, um, it can lead to eutrophication. So it can uh, degrade other ecosystems. Uh, but well, when you have a lot of nitrogen in the soil, in itself, I don't think it, it's really bad. I thought it's an analogous to the thing that uh, we have to put more and more fertilizer in certain parts because now they're not, not more autonomous and before they were, they were not autonomous. Uh, no, I, 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 well, anyway, we have increased the amount of fertilizers we are using, at least at the global scale. Um, and then, um, um, yeah, I, I mean, probably it, um, it can be true, for example, uh, some, in some part of the world, soils are really lacking phosphorus. Uh, could be, for example, in Brazil, some part of Africa, and these soils might be very uh, sensitive to the lack of phosphorus. And it might be that we have to correct 
that using more uh, fertilizers or using new practices. Um, yes. But isn't like the overused fertilizer basically because they're like really cheap? Yeah. So, um, yeah, like so cheap that you can just keep adding and adding and adding. And even if the marginal uh, return of adding an extra unit of fertilizer is very low, it's still profitable to go for it. Yeah, it's, that, 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 that's my understanding. And, and at least for farmers in France or in, in, in the States or, yeah. And, uh, but of course it's different in, in Africa. Or, uh, but it's a bit like, uh, yeah, I mean, somehow it's strange. I mean, for me, I mean, I don't know much about economy, uh, but for me, somehow it's strange that uh, phosphorus is so cheap. It's still cheap. Uh, like, uh, and oil is, uh, it's more and more expensive, but it's still cheap. If I want, I can take a plane and go to whatever, wherever I want to go in the world. And for me, it's still a bit strange. But you're right, it's, that's in the mechanisms behind. Um, okay, here on the, on the left, you have a map of uh, forests in, in Europe. And basically what you see is that you have, still have a lot of forests, but the forest is very fragmented. And uh, this is a problem for biodiversity. Basically, we know that uh, many species uh, would need big, larger uh, patches of forests to, to live in. And uh, biodiversity needs also, um, would need ecosystems to be uh, connected. Uh, so somehow the, the deconnections uh, uh, between these patches of forests in itself can be a problem for biodiversity. Um, okay, here on, on the right, the numbers are about the, the decrease in the abundance of birds. Uh, since the 80s. Um, it's difficult to, 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 to be sure about the reasons for the, the, the decrease in abundance of birds. Um, one reason could be the changes in the land uses. So ba basically when you replace forests by uh, fields, uh, this might be uh, uh, negative for some bird species. Um, probably, um, Many people think that pesticides are involved um, in these numbers. Um, probably, um, okay, some pesticides in the past have been shown to have negative impacts directly on the life of the birds, but probably the, the, this effect is also due to the fact that we're using so much pesticides that the, the abundance of insects is also decreasing. Um, so you have also numbers such as like it might be about 50% of the abundances of many insects uh, has decreased in, uh, I don't know, about 50 years. And that's probably because of pesticides and because many birds are feeding on insects, uh, the abundances of birds are also, is also decreasing. Quick question for, you know, from, the, from the forest to our, because like, there's just forest, but like, I come from Austria winters and like, there's relatively a lot of forest there, but like, it's all of this, it's just monoculture. Like, it's on a forest where, like, oh, okay, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah your, 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 remark is, your remark is interesting because uh, a forest is not a forest. You have to look at what you have in your forest. And uh, of course, in France, it's also the case. I mean, you ha we have natural forests, but we, we have a lot of uh, forests that are just used for the production of uh, wood to make uh, paper or whatever. And uh, this does not have the same effect on biodiversity. And this summer in France, we have a, we had a huge fires in the southwest of France, and there there were debates about the, the pines that were burning and whether this type of forest was suitable or not suitable. So it's suitable. Uh, but anyway, one one problems of uh, with with uh, agriculture is that it's uh, threatening uh, biodiversity. Um, Okay, I, obviously one problem is that uh, at the global scale, we have very many different types of agriculture. So what I have said now would be more, um, uh, would apply to this type of agriculture to intensive nearly industrial agriculture. Of course, in many places in the world, you have more traditional agriculture as in the upper left corner. Um, and of course, um, um, my, my understanding would be that traditional agricultural systems are much more sustainable than this system. 
Uh, but of course, um, some of these traditional systems might, might not be uh, sustainable. One problem is that, um, for example, here in Africa, it might be in Burkina Faso, um, people, they don't, they don't, they cannot use fertilizers, basically, basically because fertilizers are, are too expensive. So uh, normally they manage fertility, soil fertility using fallow. Basically they cultivate the land for a few years and then for uh, a few years, they, um, they no longer cultivate um, the field. So you have uh, natural plants, maybe shrubs, maybe some trees if they wait uh, 10 years. And uh, this practice, fallow, allows to uh, reconstruct, to rebuild the soil fertility, which is very okay. But in um, many cases, um, the, the, the duration of, uh, of the fallow is decreasing uh, just because they want to produce more and sometimes because the uh, human density is, uh, is increasing. And so the problem <laughs> is that uh, this type of agriculture, the real fun, it's very efficient. It's nearly, um, we will talk about agroecology agro later, but it's nearly agroecology because usually they cultivate many plant species at the same time, many varieties, they really manage organic matter um, and so on. Uh, but sometimes it's no longer uh, uh, sustainable just because uh, they no longer have enough land uh, to, 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 to have long uh, fallows. Um, so uh, probably this, tra I mean, this, this traditional systems, uh, at the same time, it can be a source of inspiration for uh, to make this type of agriculture more sustainable. But at the same time, they are not always uh, sustainable. And uh, for the for the food uh, independence of uh, these countries, it's, it might also be important to change the systems to to produce uh, to produce more. And um, of course, thinking about uh, Africa, if you imagine uh, countries where it's already pretty dry and pretty warm, if you increase the temperature, uh, it might become impossible uh, to make any agriculture anyway. Um, so I finished my, my first part. Uh, and basically my message is that uh, modern intensive agriculture is not sustainable. And, uh, um, I know that the, you can use sustainable in many different senses, but here what I mean is that uh, it's just not possible to go on like that. So at least we can, maybe we can go on five years, 10 years, 20 years, but at some point we will have destroyed all the soils. Uh, we, will not, we will no longer have any phosphorus available. Uh, we will have, um, yeah, what, what is important also about biodiversity? I mean, I'm an ecologist, so of course I'm, I'm I, I, I want to stop the destruction of biodiversity, but um, okay, to feed all the humans up to a certain point, it's, it's normal that we have an impact on, on biodiversity. But then the problem is that with agriculture, we, we also this, um, destroying the biodiversity. We need to grow more food. So there was no slide about that, but basically that's the problem with bees, bees and all pollinators. Uh, if we destroy bees and pollinators through pesticides and other uh, or, or the mechanisms, uh, we will no longer have any fruit and no longer any uh, vegetable, basically. Um, I'm working a lot on soil fauna, soil biodiversity. Um, it's difficult to, yeah, to have general numbers about that, but basically in a, in a field, you have far less uh, the, the, low, the, the, low, the biodiversity of soil organisms is, is, is lower than in a forest or in a permanent uh, meadow uh, next to your, your field. So basically the, the problem of agriculture is that it's also destroying, okay, it's destroying the butterfly, that's bad, but it's also destroying organisms we need to grow the food and to go on growing the food, which is totally stupid or at least it's not sustainable. Um, so the idea now about the, um, Agroecology. Um, the idea is, uh, I can try to de describe it, describe it with these diagrams. Um, basically, the idea is that you have uh, an ecosystem here, and uh, you have the, the, the functioning of the ecosystems together with uh, with biodiversity, and um, this ecosystem is providing different services to human societies. 
So we have what we call the provision, uh, the provisioning services. So it's food basically, but we have also regulating services. So, so such as the regulation of climate, uh, cleaning of water. Um, okay, we have cultural services. That would be the, um, uh, uh, for example, aesthetic aspects of the landscapes of, of the agricultural landscapes. And of course, we have also these services that would be the negative, the negative effect of of the of the ecosystems on uh, human society. So basically, uh, a farmer or ag agriculture, the idea of farming or the idea of uh, agriculture is to manage these ecosystems to provide different services. And what um, what is happening in intensive agriculture? It's what we I, I call classical engineering. Is that we are managing the ecosystems using a lot of uh, non-renewable resources, such as phosphorus, or we're emitting a lot of um, greenhouse gases. And um, of course, this, allow to, uh, this allows to provide a lot of food, quite a lot of food, but it's also leading to these services, such as eutrophication, uh, destruction of biodiversity, uh, greenhouse gases. It also leads, this also leads to the degradation of the ecosystem states. That would be the, the soil fertility uh, of the fields. So um, um, that's, that's traditional uh, intensive agriculture. Um, and the idea of um, ecological, uh, of, of, of agroecology or ecological engineering would be um, to use more uh, ecological mechanisms. Basically, we want to, uh, to use uh, less inputs, less, less, uh, less fewer, uh, fewer pesticides, less uh, fertilizers, um, less uh, fossil fuels. And we want to emphasize, we want to exploit more the regulations, the ecological regulations within uh, the ecosystem, within the field. And then we expect to improve the state of the ecosystem to improve the state of the soil, for example. And then we expect to, uh, to produce quite a lot of food, maybe not as much as with intensive agriculture. We expect to produce uh, other uh, services, such as uh, regulating services. And we also expect to reduce these services, uh, which means to um, uh, basically uh, to produce less greenhouse gases, uh, to destroy less biodiversity at a global scale, um, and so on. So, uh, yeah, basically the, the idea of agroecology is to replace um, artificial, non-sustainable inputs by ecological uh, regulations. Yes? Steve, um, what is the effect of the ecological insecurity? The, the, the effect of ecolo ecological engineering yes. on? Food security, for example, oh. if, yeah, if developing countries decide to like, um, aggressively adopt this method, how would it impact? Okay, um, I don't know. Um, what, what, what I was saying on, the, on these slides is that up to a certain point in traditional agricultural systems, uh, people are already uh, practicing. Um, uh, they're already using agroecological principles uh, because basically they do not have a lot of inputs. They do not have machines. So they are, the only way to manage fertility and, and to produce food is to use uh, ecological regulation. Um, so uh, up, to, up to a certain point, they already do so. But then my, my understanding is that, for example, in Ivory Coast, where I'm working, there is a kind of... Um, um, there is a kind of competition between traditional agricultural systems that provide enough food for the farmers, but they might not provide enough food for all the people living in, now in towns. And in Africa, the towns are growing very quickly. And um, as I was saying, I'm not sure all these traditional systems are full, fully sustainable. But then there is a competition between this type of uh, agriculture and more industrial uh, agriculture that tends to be, uh, that is no longer um, for local food production. Very often this intensive agriculture is intended to, uh, to provide food that is sold uh, internationally 
Like, that would be bananas sold uh, to France, mangoes uh, in some other country, countries that could be soybeans, uh, oil palms. Um, and so there is this competition between tradi traditional agriculture and uh, intensive uh, agriculture to, to make money, basically. And um, yeah, I don't know what will happen. And, and, and what I hope is that there is a kind of uh, middle way to try to, to, to develop uh, agroecology in a kind of um, a more systematic way, and also to apply agroecology to banana production, to soy production. Uh, but I'm not sure it will happen. And, yeah. So, so I, my, my second question is a bit off point because um, uh, at the start of the presentation, you showed the graph, uh, um, the graph concerning the contribution of different sectors to greenhouse gas. Yeah. And I saw a comparison between the agricultural sector and the transport sector. So. If I don't, if you don't mind, I'd like to know briefly how this uh, this this contribution were uh, were calculated because there is this conspiracy that uh, the uh, the contribution of the agricultural sector to the greenhouse gas emission like is inflated. So for for, uh, for example, uh, it is said that the transport sector its contribution to greenhouse gas emission is calculated only at the final stage. It does not include, for example, the making of the say vegetables okay. and uh, the whole value chain. It is not. It's not okay. Uh, there is no input. So I, I don't need that bias present here. No, I'm not able to fully answer to this question. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right in the sense that it's really. I mean, to make uh, to calculate to assess such numbers, it's really difficult because we. Um, uh, you really need to take into account many many mechanisms, many parts of the of the food production chain, for example. And and uh, I would not really know how they how yeah, they do that. Of course, I know that the emissions are bad, but sometimes it is um, alleged that um, the the value for the agriculture is inflated in order to justify sustainable agriculture. Ah. Yeah. So so some argue that because, for example. If you like, if you want to substitute massive agriculture that to an extent uh, uh, leads to like high levels of emission, you want to substitute it to more sustainable agriculture where you emit, uh, you emit less, but to an extent it will affect the total production. It, it can also affect food security in developing countries that need as much production levels as possible, even if you are to, to an extent compromise the environment. Okay. So, uh, um... I don't know. There are many debates going around such numbers. Um, my understanding is that the emissions of, of uh, greenhouse gases from agriculture are really are really high, just because agriculture is using a lot of machines, uh, and in all the steps of production and transformation, your 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 it's very industri industrialized and it's really leading to a lot of emissions. But uh, then I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, um, okay. Uh, so basically, the ideas of agroecology is to go towards an ecologically intensive agriculture, which is kind of um, the, well, there is a kind of contradiction within this expression. But basically, that's the idea to use more ecological mechanisms, uh, and to do so, we can try to get some inspiration from natural ecosystems, because natural ecosystems, by definition, they are sustainable. So basically, if you understand well how this natural ecosystem works, you can design, you might be able to design more sustainable agricultural practices. Um, so now, if you don't have any, any other questions, I will develop a few examples. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Because I wonder, do you still talk about engineering? Yeah. Um, and uh, given that, of course, we know ecosystems are highly complex and there's a lot of uncertainty, um, I wonder how do you, or like, on what do you base your confidence that managing ecosystems, even if in a good way, uh, would lead to more benefits than uh, unexpected consequences? Okay. Um... Okay, the first, way, the, the first, my first answer is, is, is here I'm using the, the expression ecological engineering, 
So I don't know whether you know about ecological engineering, but more or less ecological engineering would be the field that tried to, uh, to manage ecosystems in a sustainable way and such, uh, and, and with the goal to, produce, to provide more ecosystem services. So it's, it's, a, it's a way to, to say we want to manage ecosystems in a more ecological way and uh, uh, using more of the natural, uh, natural feedbacks, natural mechanisms you have in natural ecosystems. Uh, and my, my, uh, my way to see that is that uh, agroecology is kind of, uh, it's the application of ecological engineering to agriculture. But of course, many people working in agroecology uh, do not talk about ecological engineering or, or then I don't know how to answer your question. Um, I, I mean, I, I would like to be very confident, confident, but I am not that confident. Uh, what, what I can say is that, um, okay, again, we don't have the choice, is that intensive agriculture is not a symbol. So if we want to feed ourselves on the long term, we have to change the practices. And then um, there is an issue we have already been debating about how much food we can produce with agroecology in comparison to uh, intensive agriculture. And um, my understanding is that you, we can produce a lot of food, but then it might be uh, a bit less food than with intensive agriculture. And then we have to think about other, um, yeah, other connected issues. That, uh, and basically we know that um, agriculture cannot be sustainable if we go on eating that much meat, because basically um, um, meat consume too much uh, resources. Uh, do you know why, why meat consume much more resources than vegetables? There is a basic ecological reasons why meat is bad. Because they send off a lot of energy throughout their life, then it's kind of not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, the idea is that when um, okay, when you eat vegetables, at some point maybe some energy has been used to produce the vegetables and and, and so on. Uh, but okay, you you eat the vegetables. When you eat uh, cattle, uh, you have had to you have, you need to feed the cattle during all the life. And um, a cow, uh, when the cow is eating, could be like uh, grasses, but it could be soybeans. Um, the cow is using a part of the food to make its own biomass. But then the cow is also using a part of the food uh, to produce energy. Uh, a cow needs energy to, to walk, to, to breathe, uh, for the muscles. And, and that's very basic. That's, very, uh, that's, that's a very basic ecological mechanism. So each time you're eat, um, uh, it's a kind of trophic chain, you know, from the plants to the, the herbivores, carnivores, upper carnivores. So each time you're eating food from one more level uh, in the trophic chain, you have lost 90% uh, of the energy, 90% of the, of the biomass. Uh, so, of course, all uh, scenarios of sustainable agriculture, they talk about um, agroecology, but they also talk about reducing the consumption of meat by at least 50%, I think. And uh, the other problem is um, basically we are losing a lot of food. Uh, and at a, at a global scale, we're like losing 30% of the food produced. Um, so depending on our, in, in, in uh, developed countries, I think we lose most of the food during the um, supply chain. yeah the supply chain exactly and in, in basically in, in houses and in the fridge in the fridges and in uh, um, less developed countries we are losing more food between the fields and uh, I mean basically at the beginning of the supply chain but anyway um, yeah my, my my first answer is to say okay we have no choice uh, agriculture is not sustainable, so we have to change. And then the second answer is that we have to, less, to, to eat less meat and to, uh, to throw away less food, which in some cases might be easy, or in other cases it might be more difficult. But anyway, we have to do all that at the same time. Um, yes, Sorry, yeah. Uh, isn't the meat uh, is about the methane of uh, that the livestock? Yeah, it, I mean, it's also a problem of, uh, I mean, the one problem with the meat, it's what, what I was trying to say is that 
basically we, when you, you when you're eating meat, you're losing 90% of the resources in comparison than when you're eating cereals, basically. And, and then you have other problems like um, uh, cattle is producing a lot of methanes and greenhouse gases. And... What do you mean by losing 90% of the resources? Oh, it's, it's because it's what I was trying to explain. Basically, when you feed the, the cattle, uh, a part of the, of the food will be used for the, the, the animal to build its own biomass. And this is not lost because, of course, it's what you're going to eat at the end. But then a part of the food is going to be used by the cattle to make energy. So this is to, wasted, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is not wasted for the, for the cow, but at least it is weighted for the human society. This is what makes the cow grows, or this is what produces meat. Oh, you, you mean this energy? Eating the. Yeah, yeah, but but yeah, you, you're of course you need to feed the cow to, to 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 be able to eat meat at the end. But then, in comparisons, if you want to, uh, uh, you you have the choice. Either you have 100 kilograms of of cereal and you can eat it. Or you can give the cereals to the to, to the cow, but at the end you will just have ten kilograms of of cow. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> yes. I've read that maybe eighty or ninety percent of uh, cow food was actually not eatable by edible by uh, humans. Oh, for cows. Um, I, I don't think it's only for cows, but maybe only. Um, I mean, yeah, that, I mean that that's a good point. Um, no, I mean, this point is important because I, I basically the idea is that we have to reduce meat consumption, but probably it's important to still con consume meat and to, uh, to have some cattle breeding uh, for different types of reasons. One reason is, um, at least in some part of the world, it's not possible to grow any, any cereal, any vegetable, because it's too dry or the soil is too bad. And it might be possible to, uh, to breed cows. And then in these countries, or in small parts of countries, uh, it's very um, useful or logic to, uh, to breed cows and to go on uh, eating meat. Um, uh, and then it's, uh, I'm not, I don't know the numbers you were talking about, but for example, it's true that, um, okay, you have different trade-offs, it's complicated, but for example, uh, I agree that cows, on the average, they, 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 you feed them with the food that humans could not eat. So there is less competition. So when you grow soybeans, grow some food that would be useful for, for humans, forks. Uh, chicken and pork that are much more in competition with human for the type of food. Uh, but then on the contrary, the, uh, on the contrary, the chicken and the food, they are more efficient uh, in turning uh, food into uh, meat than cows. So it's kind of uh, complicated to know what we have to do. Um, yes. I have another In some parts of the world, it also happens that because cows are bred in, a, in open air and natural grass, it actually helps to the biodiversity of the local area as compared to doing planting soy or wheat, even if it is for direct human consumption, because these mono uh, crops actually have nothing. Yep. You, 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 you can kill every kind of life present. But because you have natural grasslands, you can breed cows, and at the same time, you can keep having natural uh, flora and fauna. Yeah, so um, it's like a, not always like. You 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 also have debates about that in the sense that, for example, um, okay, it's good to have uh, permanent past pastures for cows. You have some biodiversity in the pastures, but maybe you have less bio less biodiversity than with the uh, forests, for example, and. Uh, um, uh, but then I agree that, for example, um, uh, okay, well, well, uh, yeah, that's going in the same direction. Basically, another problem of intensive agriculture in Europe, for example, is that uh, agriculture, te agriculture tends to be specialized uh, regionally 
which means that in some areas you will just have uh, corn and in some areas you will just have wheat and in some areas you have a lot of porks and chickens in French Brittany, for example. And uh, this is disconnecting the cycles and uh, this impedes to use uh, animals to manage fertility. Because traditionally, tradi traditionally, in what we call mixed farming, you have uh, cereals, you have vegetables, you have sunflowers, and you have uh, meadows for, for cows and some porks, whatever. Uh, and in these cases, you can use, uh, for example, that's true that uh, in, the, in the meadows, it's kind of, it's kind of fallow, so the, the soil fertility is pretty pretty high, and the soil fertility tends to be maintained, and uh, so it would be good to maintain the cows for I don't know ten years in in the part of the of the farm, and then maybe you can shift, you can grow again uh, cereals, and the cows will be so, the cows will be somewhere else, and that should help to manage uh, fertility. Um, so I, my, my my understanding is that we have to decrease meat consumption. But that's at the end, we should still eat uh, some meat, and hopefully, uh, the animals will be grown in better conditions, like in the meadows outside. Um, yeah. So I think uh, if I add another dimension to make this argument more complex, because in Nigeria, the number one cause of uh, death is like violence death um, in the last, for example, 10 years is um, the farmers headers and the, the, farm, the farmers what farmers headers like uh, like uh, those that are animals the nomads yes so and the primary reason is that um this cow like their roaming is not like uh, the husbandry system okay. and the uh, cows will encroach into farmlands and eat themselves and this will lead to clashes and mm. Uh, like um, the, the full and that are already the cow, uh, they are less educated and some, sometimes they value the lives of these cows and that of even humans. So they can kill humans because mm -hmm. you harass your cow, so to say. Okay. So this is uh, they, I mean, this is going in, in the same direction that the, the previous argument in the sense that uh, um, um, animal breeding is good for, uh, I mean, somehow it could be ecologically good when it's integrated in the cropping systems. So it's better when you have, uh, I mean, at least in my opinion, what I would say is that it's better when the farmers uh, have both cereals and cattle. And of course, in Nigeria, but also in Ivory Coast where, where I'm working, uh, people having the cattle are not the same as people having uh, the fields. So you have competition, you have wars. And, uh, and of course, I mean, it's, it's I mean, it's, um, it's uh, stupid, I mean, human, for humans, but it's also ecologically, ecologically stupid because you're, you're, it does not allow to manage soil fertility, uh, combining cattle and, and, and fields. Okay, so I can try to develop some examples. Um, um, okay, My, one thing you ha we have to do is to close the nutrient, the nutrient loop. What it means is that basically, as I was saying, we are exporting the nutrients from the fields, uh, the nutrients that are within the food. Uh, so we need, we need to bring back nutrients, or we need to manage the field in such a way that we have still uh, enough nutrients. Um, so we need to decrease losses of mineral nutrients, and we need also to decrease the use of mineral fertilizers. Um, so one example is that, um, in, cro in, cropping, in cropping systems, very often we have what I call um, bare soil. So for example, here, this could be corn, and in, bet in between two uh, rows of corn, uh, you have bare soils. So when the soil is bare, um, you can, basically you can lose mineral nutrients because when the rains uh, is entering the soils, you have nothing to, to protect from the rains. And uh, you have places with, with no roots. So when you have no roots, the mineral nutrients cannot be uh, absorbed. Uh, so it, it leads to leaching. Uh, of course, in the annual systems, when you have to grow again new plants each year, uh, you also have the, the soil is bare during like, um, I don't know, four or five, um, five months. Um, and for example, if you go to the countryside now in France, you, you, will, you would have like 
half of the fields with no plants. And this uh, leads to the same leaching. Uh, you have no plants, the soil is not protected, you have no roots to absorb the mineral nutrients. So you have a lot of leaching. So the uh, one idea is to have uh, cover plants. That would mean you can grow in between the, the rows of corn, you can grow small plants, could be so small um, grasses. And during the bad season, it's possible to grow some cover crops, uh, plants that will grow for a few months. These plants will produce some biomass that will be integrated into the soil. And this is maintaining soil fertility. Um, okay. Yeah, this is also, yeah, this is also uh, uh, cover plants also reduce soil erosion. Um, maybe um, what a good idea very often for the cover plants, what we would use, we would use legume plants, uh, clover. Um, and do you know about such plants and why they are important for the cropping systems? Yes? Do they have longer root systems or stronger root systems? No, <laughs> but they have some special roots. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this, um, these plants, they have what we call nodules on the roots. And in these nodules, they have a particular bacteria in symbiosis with the plants. And these bacteria can fix the nitrogen. So basically, um, these bacteria are doing what we are doing to produce fertilizers. They are fixing the N2 from the atmosphere. But of course, we're using um, gas or oil for that. But the bacteria, uh, they are using organic matter. And in fact, the symbiosis is going this way. The plant can produce its own, its own biomass. So the plants give some uh, organic matter to the bacteria. And the bacteria are using this organic matter as a source of energy to fix the nitrogen. So of course, it's sustainable. And very often, we, we, it's a good idea to use legumes, clover, as a cover crops because it's fixing nitrogen and it's um, yeah, it, it allows to spare uh, fertilizers and, and it's managing the fertility. Um, okay, um, I can try to explain this. In Africa, we, we Ivory Coast, we're working on, on savannas. And in savannas, you have trees, but you also have grasses. And in most savannas, uh, if, if they are not disturbed, we have um, these grasses, they are perennial grasses. Perennial grasses means that they can live for more than 50 years and they make like big tussocks and um, as uh, during the rainy season the, the leaves can be as high as that or maybe a bit uh, higher so they produce a lot of biomass and um, uh, we have made different studies about that and one interesting thing is that when you have uh, perennial plants uh, you have per um, perennial root systems so you have always roots living roots in the soil and what we think is that first, it's good to have perennial roots in the soil because they can always absorb mineral nutrients. So it should uh, decrease the leaching of, um, of nutrients. Um, also, I mean, because the plant is uh, perennial, it's also protecting the, protecting the soil all the, the year round. And what we also think is that uh, because the root system is always at the same place, there will be a, an efficient recycling of the roots. The roots that sometimes they die and uh, as they decompose. And when they decompose, they re release mineral nutrients. And the plants can uh, readily uptake all these mineral nutrients because they're, they're, they are just in proximity of the, of the roots. Basically, the dead roots are very near to the living roots. So it should increase the efficiency of the recycling. So of course, when you have uh, when we're cultivating, when we are cultivating, oh, sorry, cultivating cereals, the cereals they are annuals. So each time the the, the root system uh, dies, the plants die, and each time you're putting new seeds, but the plants are never exactly at the same place. So you probably we are losing this type of efficiency of um, of recycling. Um, how could it be used for agriculture? Because here you have grasses. They are not really, they don't produce, produce any food, basically. They are not even very good to eat for cows. Uh, but how could you use this principle in agriculture? 
Yes. I, I guess when you're trying in areas where they use the Kotalu method or where they're resting the land, okay. you can use that to sort of regenerate the, the soil while it's resting. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's a good, already a good point. And it's already happening in the sense that uh, if your fallow is long enough, you will have these types of grasses and it's probably good for soil fertility. Yes? If you just take them up and leave them on the ground, then they stay. Oh, uh, yeah, but that would be like, that, that would be the principle of the fallow. You let, you let these grasses grow and at some point you, you're, you cut them and you grow something else. Um, but in fact, yeah, yeah, you have other possibilities. One thing is that you could use these grasses as, um, as cover crops or as cover plants. Basically, you can use, uh, not in this case, but for example, you could have these perennial grasses and grow corn in the middle of the perennial grasses. Um, actually, I'm not sure it's work. I mean, I'm not sure how much it would work, but um, uh, we're trying to make experiments on, on that. Um, and, and then the, the other idea, some people are trying to, to breed some new cereal varieties that are perennials. Basically the rice, corn, um, wheat, they are annual plants. Uh, but some people are trying to develop cereals that would be perennials. And um, that would be interesting because you would be able to produce the same cereal for maybe 10 years in the same field without having to, uh, to put new seeds, without having to, uh, to work your, your, your soil. And that would probably help to maintain the, the fertility. Um, okay. 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 Um, okay. Um, okay, this, this graph, uh, it's still a bit the same idea. It's about the management of soil, uh, about the management of soil fertility. And the idea is that uh, the nitrogen is coming from the atmosphere and the phosphorus, yeah, it, okay, I did not say that. The, when to make fertilizers uh, with phosphorus, you, you, you need to dig the phosphorus in, from mines. But in natural ecosystems, the phosphorus is released from uh, the rocks basically below, below the soil, you have rocks and the weathering of the, of the rocks, the weathering of the, degradation, the, the degradation of the soil. Oh, sorry, the degradation of the rock is leading to the formation of the soil and it's also releasing phosphorus. Uh, so it means that um, one problem is that when you have a young ecosystem or a young soil, uh, the, the ecosystems tend to be limited by nitrogen because uh, to have uh, the amount of nitrogen in natural ecosystems tend to increase with the age of the ecosystems, just because of this, uh, these legume plants we were talking about. And um, usually a young soil, a young ecosystem, the soil is uh, pretty shallow. So um, you, we, normally you have enough phosphorus. But then when your ecosystem is older and older, and the soil is older and older, the soil is deeper and deeper, and it's much it becomes more difficult for the plants to absorb the, the phosphorus. So that's already an, an important point. Um, so he, here it's just to remind about the fact that uh, we don't have that much phosphorus uh, mined uh, worldwide. Uh, so we have in China, Morocco, as we were saying, South Africa, United States. Um, okay, I'm not sure. Okay. and. Um, uh, one um, one way to um, uh, probably one interesting ways to um, to grow food without phosphorus and without this uh, using the, the the mines would be to grow trees in your agricultural systems because trees uh, they have deep roots so uh, trees can be uh, have roots in contact with the bedrocks with the rocks. And they can use the phosphorus directly when it's uh, released by the degradation of the of the bedrocks. Yes. Um, in my country, in the mountains, the Philippines. So we we're not famous for coffee, but we have really good coffee from oh. the northern mountains. But we don't export it because 
the indigenous communities that make it, well, they've only begun to, but they've been making it for a long time, but they use permaculture. And so you won't see flat fields of growing, the growing coffee, but they have mountain sides. And I think what they were telling me was that when the leaves fall, it fertilizes the ground and they let it get into the ground and it flavors the coffee in, the, in a certain way. They have those civet cats uh, running around wild as well. I mean, they have a lot of biodiversity. So permaculture, at least in the coffee region, is, is a big thing. And I think it's probably like this. And other islands as well use permaculture. Um, to grow food and they put different trees beside each other so that they uh, nourish the ground as well so but I don't know if it's scalable but this is what they do and they don't export the food unless we have surplus which is rarely the case. <laughs> um, yeah one, one um, um, yeah probably one problem with um, we will see that a bit later um, without that much time um, yeah, one problem with uh, with cropping systems is that we have reduced the diversity of plants. Uh, I mean, in intensive agriculture, you have land landscape with just fields. We have cut all the, the trees, and then you have just corn or uh, just nearly one species at the landscape scale, and that's probably bad. And probably trees are important in the landscape, either inside the fields or uh, outside as uh, hedges, and. Um, that's the idea of agroforestry, for example. Agroforestry is to put together maybe cereals and trees. And um, you have positive effects due to the, 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 the roots of the trees that can be, uh, that can uptake phosphorus uh, in deeper soil layers. And of course, there are also um, um, trees that bring organic matter, the dead leaves, the dead roots, that have a different quali quality from the um, traditional vegetables or, or cereals. And that's probably positive for soil fertility. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So, so that, yeah, that's another. That's an example. This is ex an example from Burkina Faso, and it's an area where people, apparently, it's a single guy who has developed a particular method to approach to manage soil fertility, and they are they are doing different things. But one thing they do is to manage trees in the ecosystems and they have um, uh, they have uh, methods to uh, regenerate forests so here you have uh, small trees and uh, the soil is very very bad and uh, to be able to grow trees basically they, they dig the soils and the soil uh, is very hard it's the, the fertility has been destroyed the structure of the soil has been destroyed so they basically they, they dig small holes they would add organic matter into these holes and they would grow the small trees here and here and here. And uh, the, the water can infiltrate into these small holes and apparently this allows the trees to, to, to grow. And uh, they have regenerated the styles of, um, of forests. Um, yeah, and the idea is that probably these trees in the landscape have a positive effect on, on soil fertility and, and on, on food production. Uh, okay, we are talking about agroforestry. So this is agroforestry in France. Um, the interesting thing is that you, you grow trees and you grow cereals, or, but you could also grow vegetables. Or, and um, this means that the, the farmers will earn money uh, by selling the cereals, but also by selling the trees. So of course the trees will have to be cut like every 20 years or every 30 years. Um, I've already explained some positive mechanisms through which uh, the trees can be uh, interesting. Um, of course, trees, they are perennials, so they have a permanent root system, uh, so they can help also to manage fertility uh, through this way. What could, be, what could be the problem with the trees? Yes? Like this system is just industrialized or can you just like slightly, slightly different? Like you chop down the trees, you release all the carbon soil. Oh, um, I mean, usually in such cases, you will, you will chop the trees, but you will export the trees to make furniture or, or whatever. So um, you will, uh, so some part of the carbon of the trees, dead roots, they will uh, decompose slowly and increase soil fertility. Okay. And uh, so, no, that's not that bad. 
but yes. Uh, the shadow. The yeah, shadow. exactly. I mean, basically, in a intensive agriculture, basically, we tend to cut trees because we think that the shadow, the shadow will decrease the production, and um, up to a certain point, that's true, uh, because there is a basically in a, in ecology, we would say that there is competition between the, the cereals and the, and the trees for the lights, because the shadows mean that the, the cereals will, will have less lights to produce biomass. Um, okay, so that's a problem. So that might be a problem. Then you have uh, different aspects. You have to think about um, the, the, the distance between the, the trees. So you can optimize the distance between the trees uh, for, to have enough light for your crops. Uh, I think you also have to think about the, the directions of the tree lines, and you, you can also optimize the direction of the tree lines because, of course, you know that the, the sun is going this way and not this way and, and so on. Um, and of course, you also have to think about the height of the trees, and basically you can optimize the systems uh, taking into, into account the, the distance between the tree lines and the, the the height of the trees. So probably you have um, you cannot let the, the tree grow forever because at some point they will be too too grow too too big and they would impede the cereals to to grow. Um, another last point is that uh, it depends on the climate. But in very uh, warm climates, in um, during some some parts of the summer, for example, uh, the weather becomes too hot. And it's uh, reducing the, the production of biomass by the, by the crop. Uh, so basically, in, in some climates, to have a bit of shadow, uh, instead of decreasing the production, it can increase uh, the production. Yes. In one agriculture, like the goal is that to kill any animal who can like, kind of eat your things. And I'm wondering if you make like these trees and stuff like that, it made it much more attractive for like birds and okay. insects. Would there be any fear of the, like that they eat more of the crop? We will uh, talk about biodiversity uh, just a bit later. But um, um, in agroecology, basically the, the basic rationale is to think that uh, if you if you increase the biodiversity, uh, including birds and, and insects and so on you will have more positive effects than negative effects, meaning that, uh, okay, maybe there will be a bit more birds that will eat uh, a bit uh, the crop, but you will also, also have birds eating the insects that can at attack the, the crop. Um, but I think, I mean, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's still something we have to study uh, because uh, I think we have the two sides of the coin at the same time. Uh, a part of the biodiversity is good, a part of the biodiversity is bad. And of course, what we have to foster is a good biodiversity, uh, which might be difficult. Um, okay, we also have to reduce the spread of, uh, of disease. Basically, we have been talking about soil fertility fertilizers, that's interesting. But the other problem of uh, agriculture is uh, pesticides. And okay, uh, pesticides are very bad, but we, it was also logic, uh, logical for farmers to use pesticide because sometimes uh, you have insects, you have small worms in the soil, you have uh, uh, fungi that attack the crops and that can destroy half or uh, more of the, of the crop. Um, so up to a certain point, pesticides is interesting. But of course, we know now that pesticides, uh, yeah, we haven't talked that much about pesticides, but uh, uh, one problem with pesticide is human health. And um, it's still something, it's still difficult to measure the impact of uh, pesticides on human health. But uh, very clearly, you have a lot of uh, farmers just dying from pesticides. And uh, for just uh, people as, as me, just eating food in, in town, um, probably there are, there are kind of um, diffuse effects of, uh, of, uh, of pesticides. Uh, leading to cancer, uh, concerts and, and, and so on. Uh, okay, there are still debates about that. And then there, there, it's very clear that pesticides kill biodiversity, both within the fields and outside the fields. And as I was saying earlier, um, it's bec becoming critical when you kill uh, bees, pollinators you need for your vegetables, or when you kill, 
kill, kill elf worms. Um, so it's what is important here is to find ways to reduce the pressure of insects, small worms, fungi that are attacking the, the crops. Um, and one, uh, I will not go into the details, but one very famous experiment, uh, it was about rice in China. And basically uh, what they want to grow is a, is a glutinous uh, rice, which apparently is very tasty and that can be uh, sold for a higher price. But this rice is very sensitive to the rice blast, which is a fungus that is attacking the, the rice. And what they try to do is to mix this glutinous uh, rice with another uh, rice variety that is less sensitive to, to, this, uh, to this fungus. And uh, what happens is that the, the non-sensitive rice variety is kind of protecting the sensitive rice variety. So it's decreasing the impact of the fungus and it also decrease, it's also decreasing the needs for pesticide. Um, could you imagine the mechanisms for which mixing variety or uh, adding a variety that is not sensitive uh, would uh, impede the negative impact of the, of the fungus? How, do, how does it work? Why mixing varieties could help reducing uh, pesticide or could, could help reducing the impact of insects, fungus, or whatever? Yes? Because it's harder to jump from one to the other. Yeah, I mean, one basic mechanism is that when you have the, your, basically the fungus, it's it spreads through uh, through spores. So you you imagine you have a spore uh, falling on the field. So the first thing is that the spore has like uh, 50 uh, 50 percent of chances to fall on a variety that it cannot attack. So it's already already decreasing the chances that the spore will uh, will have an impact on on the field. And then, as you're saying, uh, I'm not sure how, which variety is, is which, but basically the spore will have to spread maybe from from here to here to uh, infect all the fields. So it's decreasing the spread of the of the of the disease within the field. And that would be the same for insects, small worms, and and, and whatever. And uh, we also have to imagine the, imagine the same thing, the same mechanism at the at the landscape scale. Uh, you imagine you have a, a landscape. You in the landscape you just have corn, for example, and you have the same variety of corn everywhere in the landscape. Um, so if you're um, you imagine your your caterpillar uh, and you like corn, the first thing is that you have a lot of food in front of you. Uh, but you, you really have a lot of food in front of you and in and in natural ecosystem it's never the case because in a forest in the meadows you have a lot of biodiversity you never have so much food for just one uh, animal and um, we can talk about uh, darwinian evolution uh, when you have all this food in front of you you have a high pressure to select caterpillars that will that will be very efficient at eating this food so at some point you will have caterpillars, um, small worms, whatever that will very that will attack very strongly this corn and this corn variety. And because you have this corn variety everywhere in the landscape, uh, this um, caterpillar, this small worms will just destroy the corn all over the, the landscape, just because you have the same crop everywhere and the same variety everywhere. So uh, what we have what we have here within the field. Uh, we have the same thing at the larger scale, and it's probably better to uh, to stop the specialization of the landscapes uh, uh, of the agricultural landscapes and to promote um, the diversity of crops within farms or uh, at the at the village scale at the, at the landscape scale, uh, because this will this will reduce the attacks uh, of pests and this will reduce uh, the needs for um, for pesticides. Okay. Okay. Um, 
okay, we need to reduce the amount of fertilizer we are using. So we have, we have already seen that. We need to reduce the amount of um, pesticides and we need to increase productivity, or at least we, we, we need to maintain productivity. Um, and what I want to see here is that, and it's um, in, in line with what I was just saying, um, the point here is that in ecology, we know that biodiversity is good for ecosystems. I'm going to try to explain this. Uh, basically, on the, on the photo here, you see a kind of traditional uh, ecological experiments. Basically, the idea is that each small square, uh, in each small square, you have a plant community. You have different plant species. And uh, we are manipulating these plant species to have a gradient of plant biodiversity. So in some square, you have one plant species. In some square, you have two plant species. In some square, you have 10, uh, 14 plant species. And what the result is that when you increase the number of plant species, on average, you're increasing the biomass produced by the small square. Uh, so you have a positive effect on, on of the number of plant species. Um, yeah, can you imagine the mechanisms behind this effect? So we are so up to a certain point. We have already seen the, the the mechanism that would be when you increase biodiversity, you increase the sensitivity of your plant community to to pests, to insects, and so on. But can you imagine other mechanisms? Yes. I thought we were talking about before the like root systems and the different species being able to like use their root systems differently. So like maybe sharing water, sharing nitrogen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, um. Yeah. Um. That's that's a good idea. I don't know what what's the next slide. Okay. Uh. But yeah, one mechanism is um. Uh, in what you were saying, I think there are two things. You have a uh, complementarity between plants. And you might also have positive, you have synergies between plants. That's also, and also another possibility. Yes. So, sorry. Parasitism. And, and what? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, we. that's a good point. Uh, just previously, I was saying, um, somehow we, in agroecology, we believe that when you increase, for example, the, the number of trees in the landscape, this will help good insects to maintain in the landscape and they have positive effects but you're that's right that you could have um, negative insects having negative effects on, on the agriculture and um, here the, the the idea is that you, you can promote positive interactions between the plants but you're right that you're when you're increasing biodiversity you can also promote uh, competition between plants and that's what i was saying with agroforestry when you're adding trees in your landscape you have to really think how you're adding your trees to promote positive interactions and to avoid negative interactions. So that's um, here I, I will promote like ecological mechanisms and the way we're thinking in ecology. But then when you want to apply that in, in, in to develop a cropping system, you really have to think uh, in a clever way how you're doing that. Um, okay, here's that the same type of number. You're increasing the, the number of uh, species. But here you have the ratio of biomass production um, after a drought and before a drought. And what it means is that the, you see that the, when you increase the, plant species, the number of plant species, with, this is increasing the, really, the, the really resilience of the ecosystems towards the drought. So basically, biodiversity allows the ecosystems to, um, uh, to, be, to, 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 to face uh, a disturbance. Um, okay, here we have the, the different mechanisms uh, through which plant biodiversity can uh, improve uh, the production. Uh, it's a bit complicated. Um, okay, the, the easy mechanisms is, uh, is this one, it's complementarity and facilitation. Basically, that's the idea is that when you're increasing the number of species, here each hexagon is a different species. So when you're increasing the number of species, you're, um, you expect your, your, your plant community to exploit better all the resources of the ecosystems. 
So if you imagine that this rectangle is the ecosystem, and this rectangle uh, represents all the niches of the ecosystem, all the resources of the ecosystem, you can expect the different plant species to exploit better all, uh, all the resources of the ecosystems. So that would mean that some plants have shallow roots that can absorb nutrients and water from the top soil layer, and some plants will have deeper, soil, uh, deeper roots that can absorb mineral nutrients and water from deeper soil layers. Um, some plants maybe will grow very quickly in the spring and will start to produce biomass, uh, a lot of biomass in spring, but some of the plants will start to grow a bit later and will produce their biomass uh, later in the, in the season. So you can imagine mechanisms for which uh, you have complementarity. And before I was talking about legumes and very often in this mixture of plant species, adding uh, legumes is very efficient because these legumes are um, adding nitrogen to the soil and uh, this is increasing um, fertility. And uh, what is interesting in what, when you have this complementarity of, of this facilitation, when you increase diversity, you can increase the biomass production and this uh, the, the maximum biomass production of a mixture of plant species is higher than the maximum uh, plant production of a single, a, single, a single species. So you're really improving the, the, the production of your plants or your, of your plant community. The other, the other mechanism is a bit more difficult to, to understand. Um, this is called sampling effect. And the idea is that if you, you have a field and you have a field with a particular soil and uh, it's a given idea. So you, uh, you will have a given climate, uh, some rain, uh, maybe dry summer, maybe humid, humid summer, I don't know. So in these given conditions, uh, you might, okay, you might choose to just have one species or you might have many species. But if you have only one species, and if you have chosen randomly this species, uh, you, have very, you have very little chance to choose the species that will produce a lot in these conditions. Whereas here, you have, when you have more uh, many species, and here the, the height of the bar is uh, describing the production of the species, of course, when you have many species, some of the species will not be very adapted to the condition in this field during this year. But normally you will have some species that are very adaptive to be adapted to this condition during this year. <coughs> so this, uh, what this sampling effect means that when you increase the number of species, you're more likely to have species adapted to the conditions. So that uh, on the average, you're also increasing the production. Then uh, in this case, with these mechanisms, you can increase on average the production, but you cannot, you cannot increase the production over the best monoculture, over the, over the best single plants, basically. Uh, what is interesting also is that uh, with these two mechanisms, on, a, on average, <laughs> you're increasing your production, but you're also decreasing the variability of your production, uh, which is really interesting. Very often the, the farmers, uh, okay, they want to produce enough, but they really want to avoid a year without production or a year with just 50% of the normal production is just a catastrophe. It can be an economic catastrophe because uh, they cannot sell much food. So they cannot, for example, uh, pay the bank, the money they, own, they, they have to pay to the bank. And uh, in more traditional agriculture, if you have a one year, a very bad year, it's just you, ha you have no food to feed, which is really bad. So the stabilization of the food production is nearly a, is as important as a, the increase in total food production. Um, okay. So here, just a few examples about how you can increase uh, the biodiversity of the plants. Um, okay, so it's important to, to think in terms of landscape. So at the landscape scale, it's important to have uh, different types of crops, to have trees, to have edges, uh, maybe to have uh, meadows with, with cows. Uh, then you have uh, agroforestry. Here you have uh, cover plants between your rows of uh, corn. Uh, you can also mix different plant species in the same field. So here you have corn 
and uh, and soy in the same in the same field. Um, and here you have a mixture of uh, wheat varieties. Um, okay, uh, one problem with intensive agriculture is that we tend to cultivate uh, the same plant species in on very large uh, fields, and maybe also at the landscape scale, you will have everywhere the same plant species. The other issue is that um, modern um, modern crop breeding uh, has led to the selection or, of varieties that are pretty efficient, but that, but that are very homogeneous in the genetic ways. This means that uh, in modern agriculture, when you grow any plants, you're nearly, you're nearly growing uh, clones, basically. So you have reduced a lot the, the genetic diversity within the, the, the crop varieties. And what we think now is that it's important to increase again the, the genetic diversity within uh, within the, the crop varieties. So one way to do it is to mix to mix within the same field different varieties of the same of the same plant. So here you might have like five varieties of uh, of wheat, and uh, there are also some results that are showing that uh, uh, low varieties you're decreasing the sensitivity to towards uh, disease insects and, and whatever. Um, okay. Um, okay, that's a bit a bit, um, a bit theoretical also, but maybe interesting. Um, this graph is suggesting that um, when you're increasing the diversity of plants, you're uh, increasing the production of one service, one ecosystem service, maybe uh, food production, and that's that's interesting. But then the idea is that when you're if you're measuring different services at the same time. You're measuring food production, but also the the storage of carbon within the soil and the quality of water drained from the field, things like that. When you're taking into account more services, uh, you will increase even more the benefit of increasing the biodiversity of plants. Uh, and the idea can I, I think it can be pretty intuitive. Uh, this would mean, for example, that one plant would be very good at providing one service, and maybe one other plant will produce, provide another service, or maybe there will be synergies between the plants to produce more services. And um, another issue is uh, um, uh, basically to, 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 you have interactions between the number of species, the number of varieties you're cultivating, and the practices, how much pesticides you're putting, how much fertilizers you're, you're using. And there are some results that are suggesting that uh, the benefit of increasing biodiversity will increase if you decrease the amount of fertilizers and if you decrease the amount of pesticides. And I think it's also kind of intuitive. Basically, if you're putting a lot of fertilizers, if you're putting a lot of pesticide, you can use the best variety you can use a single variety and the best one. And this variety will be very efficient at, at using the pesticide, at using the, the, the fertilizers. Then if you're decreasing the pesticides, if you're decreasing the fertilizers, you need ecological mechanisms to manage pests, to manage the, the fertility of the soil. And then you have a benefit of increasing uh, biodiversity. I think I can nearly end the lecture here. Uh, okay, there was a, a last example about the fact that you have to manage soil fertility. You have also to manage the soil contents in organic matter. So I will not produce, um, explain the results, but basically it's very important to manage soil organic matter. Basically to manage soil organic matter, what you have to do is to, probably you have to reduce tillage. You have to increase the inputs of organic matter. So this can be done by uh, exporting less uh, organic matter. Or if you have some, uh, some cattle, maybe you can use uh, the dunks of the cattle to fertilize your, your, your soil. Um, cover crops are good because when you put cover crops in your system, this means that you will still produce biomass in between the good uh, seasons for, for your crop. So this is also a, a big issue. And for example, there are many initiatives at the global scale to increase soil organic matter within the soils, both to mitigate climate change, to have more carbon within soils, and also to increase soil, uh, soil fertility. Uh, okay. 
Uh, well, yes, that would be the conclusion. Uh, here we have uh, some ideas about the best levers, uh, ecological tools to use to improve the sustainability. You have to increase cultivated biodiversity. You also have, maybe I haven't talked that much about it, you have also to think about non-cultivated biodiversity. For example, pollinators, bees, earthworms, many organisms you need to, to grow your food, uh, but you're, of course you're not directly managing these organisms. Um, you also have to think about the special structure of the agroecosystems. Agro um, for example, I was, uh, I, we have been talking about, I don't know, adding hedges of trees in your landscape. We have been talking about the structure of agroforestry where you have to design precisely the, the, the way you organize your tree lines, for example. Um, yeah. Uh, of course, you also have to think about the temporal structure of your agroecosystems. Agro so, um, you have to think about the biodiversity, the structure of your agroecosystem at a given point in the time. But of course, you also have to think about the, the dynamics of this. And uh, we have been talking about fallow. Fallow, it's uh, the fact that at the same, in the same field, along the year, you will not have the same plants. Um, but in a general way, uh, rotations are important. Rotation is the fact that you're not growing the same crop each year. So it's important to think about this rotation as a way to increase also biodiversity. And uh, yeah, the last point is to really think about your, your soil to maintain soil fertility. And one thing is to yeah, decrease tillage and decrease all the work you're doing to the, to the soil. Uh, okay. Any, any question or any debates to, to launch? at this late hour. Yes? It's like, what's the extent of the agroecology movement? Is it something that's like very widespread or is it still quite niche? In the okay, um, I don't know. Um, one, thing, one, one way to see that uh, is that for me, agroecology is it's kind of umbrella for many types of agriculture. And I like agroecology in the sense it's a it's kind of way to put science into sustainability. Uh, but then, for example, for me, uh, organic agriculture would be a kind of uh, agroecology. Um, uh, permaculture, I'm not very fond of permaculture, but that would be also a kind of agroecology. So uh, if you're looking in France or worldwide, there are really many, many, many initiatives to, to, to change the agriculture. Um, then there is a the question about um, how big it is. Um, I would like to have the number about organic percentage of organic agriculture in France. Uh, it's increasing. It has been pretty low for, for a while, but it's increasing. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, that would be about 6%. Um, maybe, maybe one issue is that, um, for example, to grow vegetables, uh, uh, there are a lot of initiatives to grow vegetables in a more sustainable way. And for many reasons, it's um, when you're growing vegetables, it's possible, for example, to do permaculture. And in permaculture, you replace a lot um, fertilizers, for example, by human works. You can uh, really manipulate, manage in a very good way, soil fertility, interactions between plants, because we have a lot of uh, human works. My understanding is that it's a bit more difficult to do the same thing with cereals. You have, I mean, you need big surfaces. Um, so of course you have organic cereals, uh, organic agriculture for cereals. Uh, but it's probably more difficult to, to, to go in that direction with, with cereals. Um, yeah. But yeah, okay, what, what can I say? What, what I can say in addition is that there is still a competition between these types of agriculture uh, <laughs> worldwide. I mean, many people, and probably in this classroom, all of you are convinced that we have to change the agriculture. Exactly how we have to change it, it's more complicated, but we know that we have to change it. But then when you're looking at farmers, when you're looking at the economic sectors, uh, you have oppositions, you have competitions. And for example, um, you know about the, the war in, UK, in Ukraine and the fact that it, uh, we're, at least some countries will miss the food produced in, in Ukraine. That's a big problem. 
And uh, right from the start of the war in Ukraine, some people in France have started to say, uh, okay, uh, we must produce more food, so we have to use more fertilizers. Uh, the government, yeah, you, you want to, to impede some, the, the use of some pesticides, that's very bad, we must produce more food. And uh, so you have this, um, you have these people, this approach, and of course some other people in France were saying, no, you have, we have to, uh, uh, we need a more sustainable agriculture, whatever happens, we still produce enough food at the global scale. What is important is to, um, um, to share this food. And I mean, that's true for the moment at the global scale, we're producing enough food. The problem is to share it. The problem is more the economical system and so on. Um, so, I mean, I think we know the direction we have to, to, to where we, we, we need to go, uh, but I don't know how much or at least how quickly we will go in that direction. Yeah, and that's, that's the problem. Okay. Thank you for all the questions, interesting questions, and it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right.